a CBC uh, news live stream. My name is Diane Grant. I'm a producer with The National, and this is Dr. Louise Coulon, who is a community palliative care doctor. And we are actually sitting in the sunroom of the um, Maycourt Hospice in Ottawa. And um, I met to Coulomb uh, because uh, I decided to do a story about uh, hospice, this hospice, um, and what it's like coming to a hospice and, um, and just experiencing uh, what it's like to lose someone. And uh, um, so let me just, uh, I just want to tell you about Dr. Coulomb. She's been a palliative care doctor for 20 years. She actually goes to people's homes and she looks after people until they die. And most of the people that she uh, cares for die at home. Some of them come to hospice. And that's how I actually connected with her and, and met her because she had um, a patient, Diana uh, Fitzharris, who had ALS and she um, was at home and her husband uh, Mark was looking after her for two years, two and a half years and about a month, month and a half before Diana died, um, uh, they were referred to Dr. Coulomb, which is what usually happens. Is that right, Dr. That's Coulomb? Right. That's right, yes. And what did you see? What did you see when you went to um, their home, went to Diana's home? Well, Diana was young and she had a young daughter and the home was basically a two-story home that also worked as a business uh, place. So it was difficult. Her bed was upstairs. Her All of the things she loved to do was downstairs. So the struggle to go from upstairs to downstairs with lifts just in looking at it, I thought this is not going to be possible at near end of life because she, we couldn't change the house in a way that she could be on one floor and still um, use the energy she had to the maximum. And, and, and she so had she told me when we first met, she wanted to stay at home as long as possible because she wanted to be out in her garden and she wanted to spend time with her daughter. And so when thinking about when she wouldn't be able to stay at home, what we basically said, we would take her to a place where the care would be done, where her husband and daughter could be family and not caregivers, where she could go out in a garden and where her daughter could be there as often as she wanted. So she would have the same things at hospice that were important for her at home. When you usually, when you do go, when you are referred to a, a patient, a new patient, um, what kind of questions do people ask you when you go to their home? What's, what, what happens? What's the usual, if there is a usual? I don't know if there is. When I first started doing this 20 years ago, I used to meet the family in the parking lot. And they would come to me and they would say, don't talk about death and dying because that, they'll lose hope. And so it was a time to build trust. And then about five years later, I would come to the door and they'd say, we know you. I, how do you know me? Will we read the obits? And they say, you're a good doctor, so you can come in. But don't talk too much about death and dying because they won't want to know about that. And now over the last 10 years, when I come in, and the first visit is really to get to know the patient and the family and not to push their, their needs for the future, just to get to know them and see what their wishes are, what their desires are, what their problems are, and build a little trust. But now, before I leave, if I ask the question, what is it that you want to know? Do you have any questions? They go, well, of course we have questions. We want to know how long, and we want to know what it's going to be like. And so with that, I've developed a triangle. Could, and you, the, could you show us your triangle? So this is my triangle that I show to all my patients and families. And it basically says that the body is an organism that's very sophisticated and very organized. And when it runs out of reserve energy, it shuts itself down in a very, very regimented way. And if allowed to do that and kept in the best balance, 
the dying process is not scary and it's not filled with pain and lots of symptoms. So really what palliative care is, is to look at where the patient is in this triangle and to bring back the equilibrium. If someone's got nausea and vomiting, you control the nausea and vomiting. And when they've got nausea and vomiting, they can't eat. When you control it, they go back down to this level where they can enjoy their, their life and their reserve energy. So just briefly going up here, the most important part is the automatic part of the brain that controls all the automatic functions in the body. The heart and lungs, which give oxygen to all the different parts of the body. The kidneys, which maintain the inner environment. And those three levels are the most important for survival. And when the body does that and takes care of business there, it allows some time to eat and make new energy. And then it allows some time to think and interact with the environment and their families and to be able to use their muscles to do things. We have a question. Okay. So, um, it, it, you know, they, the thing is, is that we don't really talk a lot about about dying, it seems like it's a difficult thing for us to talk about, um, and yet uh, it's we're all going to die. We're all, you know, it's it's happening. It's going to happen for all of us. Um, but I do have a question here from uh, Rhonda Weeb, um, who is um, she's asking the question: Does Canada have adequate palliative care for all of its citizens? Um, and uh, it's quite a complicated question, so I'll just, you know, I'll start with that one. Um, uh, does Canada have adequate uh, palliative care for all its citizens? The simple mm -hmm. answer to that is no. Okay, the complicated answer to that is that it is the, the population, it's the education of the population and the families that are going to promote that and make that happen. So recently I had a patient in a family who had taken care of each cup, part of the couple, had taken care of a family member in the past, and now this lady's mother was in, at near end of life. And in the hospital, they knew what this was all about, and they asked the physicians to provide palliative care for them. And through that whole process, they were rejected. It's not time for palliative care no, 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 you don't need palliative care, we need to take care of her better and sort out her problems and then we'll refer you to palliative care. And they basically said, no, my mother is in her 80s and we want to take her home and we want palliative care. So really what it was is them pushing to get me to go in there and to do uh, the care and to keep her at home and keep her comfortable and find her balance in the home. So that's how it's going to start. The whole Canadian population is aging and we're all going to die and when I go to various meetings I see a lot of people with gray hair and so we need to start talking about it and it needs to come from the community from every individual to talk to their doctors who then have to talk to the specialists and get this thing pushed forward unfortunately what happens with funding is it's not elegant palliative care is not elegant People go home uh, or stay in the hospital and they die and once that process is done then the family doesn't want to talk about it anymore right so it's not as if you cure someone and that person then is better their heart attack is improved and they go out and do fundraising and promote this palliative care is very much in the background after 22 years it's now starting to change as I say first I was in the parking lot then I was at home and now people are saying, tell me what to do. Tell me, it's important, we want to take care of our loved one. Okay, well, we've got a lot more uh, um, comments coming in. Um, uh, Robert uh, Desinga uh, said, as an aging rock climber, hopefully my end of life will involve a painless fall with a quick stop at the end. Far better a way to pass on than filled with pharmaceuticals. Um, Kim Shepard O'Neill said that every hospital should have that triangle, that triangle that you just uh, were t telling us about, should have it in intensive care. What do you think about that? I think they're right. I mean, when I take out this triangle... Can you show us again, just so that someone's just joined us? And show it to families when they say, how is this going to happen? 
I look at this and basically say this is generally what's going to happen and then I put their disease onto it because everyone is individual. And when they look at that, they look at me and they say, how come no one ever told us this before? It makes so much sense. And it is clear. It takes a lot of the emotion away. If someone is here and their kidneys aren't functioning, you can't feed them because that isn't important and the body will just get rid of the food that you're giving the patient. The rock climber, you're down here and that's great. And if you have a sudden fall and if it's bad enough, then you're going to go right to here and you're going to die. But most people who are down here, yes, they want to die suddenly, but not when they're well. And so it becomes a paradox and it's, it's difficult. But basically, if we follow this and pay attention to the body's signals, then the death process is really calm and comfortable and can be done with family for the most part, with a link for someone because I've taken care of my mother, my grandmother, my father at home, and I'm a doctor, and when things went wrong, I didn't know what was going on. So you need that objective link to help you through it because you are the experts of your loved one. You're the experts of yourself, but when you're emotional, you just don't make good de objective decisions. So you need that backup and help. So we've got a few more um, uh, questions. Uh, Coralyn McDowell is asking, if a resident is in any kind of long-term care, they should never be allowed to die alone. Why is this not mandated? You're right. And again, it becomes the community. As far as I'm concerned, people who are in long-term care facilities, that is their home. So when they get to the stage where they're in a palliative mode, the resources should be increased for that person so they don't die alone. They, the family should be involved in decision making. So if the choice is comfort measures only, they should not be taken to the hospital in the middle of the night. Those things should be done. And those are places where it should be the easiest to be done. Uh, Sandy uh, Chase uh, says, um, where I live, it seems no one can die at home. Instead, they are sent to a hospital and sometimes die alone. It's awful. That was her comment. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Marriott uh, de Saint Denis uh, is asking you, in your opinion, um, you want your opinion on alternative healing, like therapeutic touch to help uh, patients transition through death. What do you think of that? My sense with alternative treatments, Reiki, therapeutic touch, uh, meditation, they're a way of getting you to center within your internal energy. And so they're all very good. What works for some people doesn't work for other people. For example, if I'm going to do hypnosis for myself, I'd like to be on top of a mountain. If you put me in the ocean, I'm afraid of drowning. That won't work for me. But you put me on top of a mountain, that will be the best thing in the world for me. So everyone has their thing that lets them center themselves and find some peace. And so yes, that's very important to do. Uh, Yvonne, uh, I might get your last name um, wrong, uh, Yvonne Koig. K-E-O-G-H. Uh, Yvonne is asking, um, organ donation seems to be impossible in a hospice environment. The patient needs to die in a hospital in order to donate organs. Is there a better way? No, that's not quite accurate. Um, the, it, it really depends from what you're dying. If you have a cancer, there are certain organs, and the cancer is pervasive, certain organs that you can't donate but you certainly can donate your cornea and that can be done through going to the to the funeral home and the funeral home if it's done ahead of time can keep the body and the and the cornea viable so that someone a team from the hospital can come and take the cornea so that can be done but you have to figure out with the disease from which they're dying which organs might be viable I'm just going to go back to the first person who asked a question. It was Rhonda Weeb, and she was asking, does uh, Canada have quit palliative care for all its citizens? But her second question was, uh, should we be offering medical aid in dying when we can't offer palliative care? And I was just wondering whether you, um, what would you say to Rhonda about that? Uh, my biggest concern with MAID 
is that there are so few people who really understand the process of dying and so a lot of the decisions can't be fully informed of choosing to have a natural death or to have made made which is medical, medical aid in, death, in, dying. De in dying or physician assisted suicide or euthanasia um, so they I mean often I have families come and talk to me and they may say and bring up the su the subject of maid and when I explain to them how the process is going to be, they look at me and they go, there was no need for me to have medical assistance in dying. It looks like you can help and make my loved one really comfortable and I don't need to do that. So if that happens with almost all of my patients who don't know how the process of dying is, it's, it concerns me that sometimes the decision for made is made for reasons like I don't want to be a burden to my family, I'm afraid I'm going to die in terrible pain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I think there has to be a lot of education in Canada. We need to start talking about the dying process and what we want um, and we need to have the resources so that there's an option. Uh, um, Sarah uh, Eisner is uh has a um, is t is has a question. My grandmother is in the final stages of bone cancer in palliative care in Newfoundland, and I live with my young children in Nova Scotia. What advice would you give a family who do not live close by? What can we do to help those involved in the daily life of my 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 nan, my grandmother? Um, I feel very helpless living far away. That, that is a very difficult situation. What we'd like to be able to do is predict how long this is going to be so that you can come with your mother at a time when it is going to be the most beneficial for you and for your mother. So every family has a different take on that. One family would say, I want to be there when I can talk to her, when I can help her do her daily activities for a certain amount of time and we can say goodbye to each other. Another family member might say, I want to come there near the end so that I can be with her when she's dying. And again, this triangle is what helps me. Someone that's out of town, when they're at this level, you cannot predict. The way you can predict that someone is going is deteriorating is what happens every week. Have they changed? Have they, are they doing the same activity or a lot less activity? When they're at this level and they're not eating, then we're looking at a few weeks to a few months of life. So is that the time you come and want to talk to her and be there with her? When you're looking where the kidneys are failing, then you're looking at days to a few weeks. So if you want to be there close to the death time, that's the time to go, to maybe avoid her from going to hospital and taking care of her at home. So that's why I use this triangle is to help try and make these predictions so that families can make a decision for themselves. But you have to understand the dying process to be able to make informed decisions that way. And, and uh, Carolyn McDowell um, is, I, is asking this question, what are the first signs that someone is dying? It seems like there are many signs. When I come to someone's home, the first question I do is look at them and say, tell me what happened in the last year. Tell me how she was a year ago, how she was six months ago, how she was two months ago. And I get to see the world getting smaller and smaller. And again, you're at this level. If her vital signs are fine, I come with a little machine that measures the oxygen at the finger. Okay, the finger's not very important. If the oxygen is perfect and the pulse to achieve that is normal, then they're down at this level. If they're not eating, then I know I have to make changes and do things more quickly. If they're not drinking, I know that things are going to change really quickly. So that's how I do it, and I tell my families what I'm doing, what I'm looking for, and they're the experts. They see it happen faster than I do, so they start telling me what's happening and when it's happening and how long things are going to be. So I like to involve the family completely into what I'm doing. There, the patient is the center, the family is the next level, and I'm the link to help them understand what it is that they're seeing. So Elena uh, Litowski uh, asks, 
is asking, why aren't the same supplies available to a person who chooses to pass at home as someone in the hospital? Something as simple as wedges for repositioning and heel boots to prevent pressure ulcers? Again, we're, the community resources in Ottawa make some equipment available. It's a matter of financial constraints to give the most essential equipment to the most, the greatest number of people. So in the past, financial things, depending on the governments, have changed. Sometimes I go and they allow nurses to come in eight hours a day, five days a week for the last few weeks. Then they say, no, we're not going to do that anymore, and they have personal support workers. And then they don't do that and have people come in every few days. Before, they used to have a hospital bed that was free for a couple of months. Now it's two weeks. So it's part of the financial thing. It's part of the thing that there's limited money, and hospitals are higher profile. They get more of the money. So again, it becomes a community thing to say, hey, if we keep someone at home, yeah, it's good for us. It's a win for the government. Give us some money so that we can do this and save money in the hospitals. So um, Shelley Anthony Brown um, uh, says, palliative care nursing was my absolute favorite part of care uh, I have had, uh, th that I've ever worked in. Um, and she says, I have always taken care of my patients as if they were my own family. Comfort is of the main priority. I've cried and held hands. Kathy uh, McMahon says, has, is asking, she's from Alder uh, Grove, BC. Uh, she says um, to you, uh, Dr. Colomb, this is such a great wealth of information and thank you for all that you do. Is there a course on how to assist family members with the dying process at home? Um, that's one question, is there a course? And her other question is, um, also, is there any hospice that is LGBT friendly, like Casey House in Toronto? And I don't. And so there are two questions there. So the first one is: Is there a course um, on how to assist family members with the dying process at home? There are various courses that um, that are effective. Most of the courses don't have to do with people dying at home because it was so rare to have people dying at home and there wasn't a lot of experience. Hospice Care um, Ontario, Hospice Care throughout Canada are now offering these courses so if you um, access them they have websites and they will let you know where the courses are. What I've found is I've learned how to do palliative care in the community through my patients. They have taught me so much and this makes me feel that you know there are a lot of patients who are dying who feel that they're a burden to society they're a burden to their family what i tell them is that they are actually an inspiration to the next generation and caring for patients at home with families around them with three different generations with everyone participating is moving that forward and so i've asked many of my patients who have given me the privilege to be there how would you feel if I used your story to be able to build up uh, enough stories, enough information to be able to write a book and transmit that so that you can really feel that even though you're dying, you're still providing a service to the community, to Canada. And all of them have said yes. So, so that's what I'm in the process of doing. So hopefully in the next year or so, there will be this book with all these patient stories highlighting what it's like to be at home, the complications, the problems, and the joys that go with it. Have you decided on a name for your book? Right now it's called The Palliative Care Digest. Uh, it's a summary of things. It's in three parts. One is, like my triangle, it's, it's, it's looking at all the different um, symptoms in palliative care, putting them on a triangle and for physicians and caregivers, nurses to say, hey, this is the basis of the care. These are the things that are possible. Then there's a section because all of my patients, I've taken care of thousands of patients. They're on a database for me in the computer. So I take care of 95% of my patients from the time they're referred to me to their death. So I have a wealth 
of information where I can start to say, hey, this was the problem, this is what we tried, and this is the outcome in the next thousand patients. So there's that part and the rest are, are stories illustrating all of these things. So uh, Sandy Chase um, uh, says, uh, my mother knew she was dying uh, in, uh, in that she told my son, I, and she told my son, uh, I don't want to die. And uh, so how can we help the dying when they're, I guess, afraid of dying? I, I think you need to be open to the conversation. Um, when I first started this, families were saying, my mother doesn't know she's dying and we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to hurt her. We don't want her to lose hope. If I have to tell you a story, I had this young man, uh, 14 years old, and the family wanted me to come just for the pump so that he, we can control his pain. Don't talk about death and dying. He was in the, he, he was in the way out in the country. So I went there and everyone's looking at me saying, don't say those words. And I opened the door, walked in, said, hi, Jeremy. And he went, oh, you're the doctor who's gonna help me die. So they know already, but they may not want to talk about it. So it's to leave the conversation open. For my mother, the only thing she told me, one is she wanted to go home, but she kept saying, but if it's too much trouble, don't take me home. And the only thing she said about dying, she looked at me one day and she said, you know, it's re really hurts not to be able to see my grandchildren grow up. And that was it. But she came home, she allowed me to take care of her, and we knew, we communicated that we loved each other. And sometimes that's the only way it is. Sometimes they want to talk about it. So uh, Tracy Humphrey says, is asking a question. Um, I understand you can't give the best drugs when you're in hospice, like fentanyl, which is a clean drug to keep you aware of where you are. Is that true? No, that's completely false. Um, we can give any of the major drugs at home and in hospice and give it in a way that is to reestablish the equilibrium. So the best comfort, the clearest mind, the best rest at night, that's what we're aiming for. And it could be any of the opioids. Fentanyl is good as a patch. The problem with fentanyl um, is that it's not, it's very, very strong, but it's not very, um, uh, it doesn't dissolve in water very well. So you can't give high concentrations when you're giving it under the skin, because at hospice, we rarely use the IV route. We use the subcutaneous route because it's so much easier. And so you, we use a combination of fentanyl, hydromorphone, morphine, whatever works best for the, for the patient. Uh, Becky McDonald <coughs> is asking, what kind of mental health programs are lacking in hospice care? That's a sort of Actually, we like to have our patients come to hospice, whether it's day hospice or the hospice program where the volunteers go to the home, because they have a social work program that helps the family, the children. Um, and so it's one of the best places where you can get uh, psychosocial care and bereavement care in palliative care. So it's actually better than in the, the, the rest of the community or even in the hospital. Um, so it's a good place to get into hospice care really quickly and use their resources and they help you through the whole process and provide respite care for day hospice programs, um, some camaraderie with other patients with the same problem, so. Zale So asks, is asking, can you explain doctor-assisted death? Sure. Uh, basically, I am not a proponent in, it's called MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying. It's actually euthanasia in Ottawa, in Ontario. Basically, it is an IV that started and if you look at this, the way the body shuts itself down, okay, first of all, it makes you sleepy when you don't have reserve energy so it can take care of business. And then it takes care of the heart and lungs and then the brain stem, okay? If you have physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, what they do is they brutally 
try and stop the body from functioning. So first, they give a medication 100 times the dose of a tranquilizer to see if they can put you to sleep. And before they find out if you really go to sleep with this, then they give you a medication called in the, a barbiturate that tries to stop the heart. Its side effect is to stop the heart beating. So they give you 100 times the usual dose to see if they can get your heart beating. But before they find out if your heart's going to stop, then they give you a paralyzing drug, and hopefully by then you're asleep, that is going to prevent your breathing. It's going to suffocate you to death. And that's essentially the way the body does it, but the body does it in a very gentle way and, and it's calm and comfortable. This one is a hundred times the dose of three drugs to see if it can overwhelm the body's fighting survival instinct and have you die quickly. And it works most of the time, but it is not a medical procedure. It is basically three drugs into the IV trying to kill the body. So uh, Catherine uh, L. Harrison uh, asks a, a question that um, I've heard a lot of people ask. Uh, do painkillers put the dying patient into a coma? Are they used to hasten the death of that patient? Now that's, that's a real myth that people are really afraid of. And a lot of that is because they watch too much TV. And I cringe at every scene on, on television where this big healthy man is choking this woman and somebody comes behind and gives them an injection and the body falls and collapses and they go unconscious. Uh, that doesn't work. At least 20 minutes before that would even have a chance to start making him sleepier. So there's this real sense that a tiny bit of an opioid is going to kill a patient. The reality, and I often say that with families, when I finally got a patient comfortable and they're going, but this isn't a life for them. Maybe you should you know, give them a little bit more so they die more quickly. And I go, oh, I'll just stop the medication. Oh, but they'll be uncomfortable. I said, yeah, but they'll waste energy and they'll die much faster. It's okay, give them the drugs, let them live longer. We want them to be comfortable. So no, we use drugs in therapeutic doses. I have many of my patients on opioids with a pump that are walking around, doing things, going to movies. Um, they're perfectly intact. Really what it is, is when someone's dying and they go beyond that point, it's the body that puts them to sleep. And the body wants it because it doesn't want to waste energy in these parts. It wants to use all the energy to survive. Uh, um, a YouTube uh, user uh, is uh, commenting. He said, um, when my dad, or she said, when my dad was actively dying, he was trying to tear off his clothing and he had confusion. So um, I guess uh, the question, uh, question that maybe would be a good one is, um, what can family members expect to happen when someone is, is okay. dying? Often there are two ways that when the, the body gets into a crisis and goes down a step, people can, we can see the physical signs, difficulty breathing, nausea and vomiting. But some people, when they go from one step to the next, the first thing we see is this disequilibrium as a confusion. And you're wondering what's going on. I often get the call saying the patient's not sleeping at night, where they were sleeping at night before. And I come and evaluate and we see that when, once we get them calm, that there are changes up here. And once we get them calm and the body reestablishes equilibrium, then we can cut down the medications that stop the confusion and often they'll come back. Not perfect, but controlled. And so an acute agitated delirium is a sign that this body is out of equilibrium and we need to work really hard and really quickly to reestablish that balance. Uh, Carlin uh, McDowell is a is, uh, healthcare aide and, and she says, as a healthcare aide, I find we get confused as to what we can and can't say or what we can answer. Even though the family looks to us for information because we are hands-on, um, do you only have these talks with patients? So do you have talks with, uh, um, I guess, healthcare aides? I 
talk to whoever wants to listen to me talk. So I have church groups who want to do more than just the religious thing. They want to go out and help people in the community. I have uh, senior groups that want to talk to me. I have community nurses and personal support workers who set up a talk and want to talk to me, and I'm quite willing to do that. Uh, Stephanie Bly uh, is asking, is it true that most of the money a hospice runs on is by donation? Yeah, I just had a meeting today with physicians in the Hospice Care Ottawa, and the hospice has to, to run two hospices uh, community hospices with 19 beds, they have to fundraise $2 million a year. And the, ho the government pays the other half. So they're basically fundraising for half of the costs of the hospital. And they're also um, volunteers. And there's volunteers on that top, of that, on top and of that. That's right. So yeah, it's, it's true. So uh, uh, Dr. Kulom, it's, uh, it's I think we're almost out of time. Is there anything that uh, you um, want to share about your 20 years of working? Basically, the reason I went into palliative care is my patient said, we're staying at home, you've got to learn how to take care of us there. When I went into the uh, palliative care, regional palliative care in Ottawa, they looked at me and they said, we were out of control at home and now we're comfortable. This is a really nice place. Look at all the doctors. Quit your job and come and take care of us at home because that's where we want to be. That's the best place. And I didn't believe them. I came out to the community to try and do this, to prove to them that it couldn't be done because as a physician caring for my family, I had trouble. How could people who are non-medical take care of their families? They proved me wrong. In that whole 22 years, of the patients who wanted to die at home, 80% could. 15% in the last few weeks needed the hospice, and only 5% went back to the hospital. That comes from the community, from the families, from the patients themselves. That's the way it has to be. If you want to push palliative care forward, and we need to, it has to be a community ground roots effort. We've got a few more questions, <laughs> Dr. Colum. Um, uh, Marnie Stretch, uh, she uh, is asking, what does it mean when someone appears to be and sounds like they're in agony um, during their f last few hours? Uh, this happened with both my parents. It was very upsetting. Both were medicated. Okay. So uh, what I said was the body was a survival organism. When the kidneys fail, okay, the heart and lungs try and take over as an emergency the, the work of the kidneys. So you get into this deep, very deep, full of effort type of breathing. They're asleep, but they look like they're working very hard. In the end, there are four ways to die. Two are sudden. Suddenly your heart, you can have a heart attack. Suddenly there's nothing no blood that goes to the automatic part of the brain. Those are sudden deaths. That's how we all want to die, but not when we're well. The ways that in the end, there are two muscles that are the most important. Those ones are fairly predictable. If the muscles of breathing tire first, the death is very quiet. You just simply forget to breathe. There's a buildup of carbon dioxide. It's like carbon monoxide poisoning. You go to sleep. If the heart fails first, there's a lot of congestion. People call it the, rattle, the death rattle. It's because there's fluid that builds up in the lungs. And that feels like they're working hard with these two types of breathing, and it feels like they're in anguish, but actually they are surviving. And we give the medication so that they're fighters, but we let them fight comfortably so they don't feel like they're struggling. I've got um, one more question, and then maybe We'll wrap, but we'll just see. Dr. Colon. Um, uh, so YouTube viewer is asking, um, my dad had a bad stroke and has been in the hospital for about one and a half months. He's waiting for long-term care, but he seems to be deteriorating quickly. How do we know if he will even make it to long-term care? Um, basically, again, using this triangle, it depends where the stroke is. If the stroke is down here and he's still able to eat, then this could go on for a long time. But if the stroke is now starting to affect the brain stem, what you'll see is that 
He can no, no longer tolerate eating. You'll start to see changes in his breathing, which is the deep, rapid breathing, or he'll become congested. And if he starts to do this and not be able to eat, it's really this part of the brain that's affected, and no, he won't make it there. If it's down here, and you feed him just what he needs, and don't let him overfeed him so that he then vomits and goes into his lungs, then he might make it. That's how you know. So, Dr. Coulomb, um, um, I don't know whether we don't have any more questions, and so um, I guess we'll, I think we just have to talk until we're told that we're not live <laughs> anymore. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, Dr. Coloma, the one thing that, the, I, I, I think that that triangle really, you know, helped me or just made me realize what was going on with my husband because, you know, um, you said that the muscles take the most energy of, of a person and I remember when he was dying, he had cancer and he was just exercising. You I know? could see that in just the video that you did. Yes. And, and really, and the next day he couldn't move and I didn't realize that, uh, you know, he wanted to exercise because he wanted to get better, he wanted to get stronger, but it doesn't work like that, does it? No. The reason I choose a triangle too is that the things that are the most important for survival take the least energy. The body's really smart things that take the least, the, that are the least important for survival take the most energy. So what you need to do and what I tell my families is pace, pace, pace. And we do this through holiday seasons, family reunions is, if you're going to a family reunion, okay, then the day before take your shower, then rest, don't do anything the day of, go there, bring your drugs with you, enjoy your time. When you're finished, take your drugs really quickly, go home, go to bed, and take a day to recover. If you do that, the body's really good and it'll help you recover. If you don't do that, then you start going.